Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Living in the West, a series of episodes where we investigate and look into the lives of the Muslims living in the West, the importance of the subject, the permissibility of this group of Muslims living in the West. We spoke in previous episodes about the vision for this group of Muslims, a personal vision and a community-based vision. Uh, with me discussing this is Sheikh Haytham Al Haddad from the Muslim Research and Development Foundation from the United Kingdom. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, in previous episodes, we did speak uh, briefly but concisely uh, about the Sharia law, uh, the implementation of parts of the Sharia law, which you explained the Muslim personal law. Now, many people say, why is it that the community, we spoke about two levels, of course, the personal community. The community level needs to establish or get recognized the personal law for the Muslim. Why is it so important when we have mosques who perform some of these laws? They've been there already. They've established, as we say. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen. Nabiina Muhammad wa ala ahli wa sahbihi ajma'in. We need that, okay, of, for different reasons. First of all, as we said, that other communities, they have elements of their sharia mm -hmm. implemented or incorporated within the judicial system. Maybe you know that the Jewish community uh, have uh, reached, arrived to a level of recognition for elements of their sharia within the British judicial system. And the Divorce Act of 2002 uh, has been amended to say that the, uh, for the Jewish community, the divorce will not be obsolete unless the religious divorce takes place. Okay? Now, uh, then they said any prescribed religion, okay, mm -hmm. uh, any prescribed religion, the divorce will not be obsolete uh, in, unless the religious divorce is taking place. Mm. Now, what does this mean? It means that by law, by law, the divorce cannot be an absolute divorce unless the religious divorce, okay, which is an official, unofficial divorce, takes place. So this is official, this is something in statute now. This is now in Divorce Act of 2002. And the Jewish community achieved that. Now, why don't we as Muslims achieve something similar? Yes, it is true that we might have more, but as we said earlier, that we as Muslims have more, um, more demands because of the nature of our way of life, because of the nature of our religion. This is one thing. The other thing is the point that you have mentioned. By the way, the uh, Sikh religious marriage mm -hmm. is a requirement for the civil marriage, for the civil marriage between two Sikh members. So, which means that there is another recognition for another faith, okay? So why don't we have that as Muslim? And what we are talking about here, we are talking about elements of the Muslim personal law, such as marriage, divorce, maybe inheritance law, and uh, maybe the law of custody. Mm -hmm. We are talking about these things. The other reason for the need for official recognition for the Muslim personal law mm -hmm. While, as you said, that uh, it has been implemented, uh, implemented 
unofficially sure, yes. by the mosques or the imams. No, that is a little bit problematic. And here uh, we might talk about some uh, legalities. Mm -hmm. And because this discussion is quite an intellectual and academic discussion, might, it might be good to uh, shed some light on this uh, legal issue. Mm -hmm. You know, in uh, the issue of divorce, let us take the typical example of divorce or the typical example of marriage dissolution. Mm -hmm. Marriage dissolution, or as many people call it, khula, mm -hmm. where a court, which is a third party, decides to dissolve the marriage. Now, in a Muslim country, mm -hmm. the authority has been given to Ulil Amr, as Allah Jalla wa said in the Quran, wa ati'u Allah wa rasoola wa ulil amri minkum, wa ati'u Allah wa ati'u rasoola wa ulil amri minkum. The authority has been given to Ulil Amr. The people in the, charge of you. The people in charge of that country. Mm -hmm. The people in charge of the country might disseminate this um, authority to the qadis. So the qadis, the judges and the Islamic courts are representatives of Wali al-Amr. So their decision is, or their decisions are binding on the inhabitants of that country. Mm -hmm. The decisions are binding. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in the, in the non-Muslim countries, because there is no Wali al-Amr, there is no single representation for Muslims who is going to take decisions that are binding on other Muslims. I hope that the point is clear because mm -hmm. this is a very delicate issue. Mm -hmm. Who is taking decisions that have this kind of nature binding on other people? Now, the issue of marriage is easy, is easy because it is the consent of the husband and the consent of the wali. So consent from both parties, okay, to get into this contract. But marriage dissolution, different from dissolve, uh, from, different from divorce. Mm -hmm. Aqadi is taking a decision to dissolve a marriage that has been established by the consent of two parties. Mm -hmm. Who are you to dissolve that? Who gave you the authority to dissolve that marriage? So that authority has to come from somewhere. And in these cases, the marriage dissolution, the wife is asking for or asking for the dissolution of her marriage mm -hmm. from the husband. In most cases, the husband is not agreeing with this and... Ultimately, the husband doesn't agree with the authority of this imam or this judge. So, in that case, if the imam decides to dissolve the marriage, will his decision be binding on the husband? This is a big question. But in that case, you're saying that you're using, you're going to be using, um, how say, a non-Muslim um, law to not bind, but help bind these decisions. Exactly. Okay. Uh, le let me give you another example before uh, mm -hmm. shedding some light on this uh, issue. Now, if um, an imam mm -hmm. of a certain mosque decides to dissolve the marriage of these two couples mm -hmm. and the husband went to another imam mm -hmm. and he gave him his version of the story, and the imam decides that the dissolution issued by the other imam is void and null, mm -hmm. whose decision is going to take over? This imam or the first imam? This is a big question. Your point is a very valid point. Now, where are we going to get this authority from? Now, the fuqaha uh, mentioned that this authority of course, it can be taken from the Wali uh, al-Amr, the people in charge. If there is no Wali al-Amr, the Fuqaha stated that the group of Muslims, their decision can take the legality or the, the status of the decision taken by Wali al-Amr. 
because they are the representatives of Muslims, the group of Muslims. And the Maliki scholars have stated that clearly. Other fuqaha as well mentioned it, that تقوم جماعة المسلمين مقام ولي الأمر في حالة غياب ولي الأمر. Now, so the place of a group of Muslims will take the place of the wali al the person in charge, when he's not available. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. therefore, what we are proposing, if the group of Muslims or the Muslim community decides to appoint one Muslim as a judge or decided to appoint a body as the Islamic court, then this body is an official, uh, sorry, the decisions of this body are binding on the Muslim community. Mm. Now, this is one way to do it. Of course, there are some flaws in this way. The other way to do it is that the government itself, even if it is a non-Muslim government, mm -hmm. because we are living from a civil point of view under the authority of that government, so from the civil point of view, they have a limited position of wilayat al-amr, okay? Mm -hmm. And here we have to be careful because uh, this civil position, okay, mm -hmm. is like an administrative position. For example, their position is to uh, arrange traffic. Mm -hmm. And we have to abide by that law. No one should say by th that law has been given by a non-Muslim leader. But yes, a non-Muslim leader... Okay, hmm. he should be followed and obeyed within these boundaries because of a kind of a contract between you and him or because of the social contract that we have mentioned uh, before. Even if you discard these two elements, if you don't listen to him in these civil issues, then there will be a chaotic situation. And Islam is against this. So if from this perspective, the the person in charge of that country, if the person or the government of the non-Muslim country appointed certain individuals to be the Islamic judges or appointed certain organizations mm. to be the Islamic courts and the second conditions, this appointment has been accepted by the vast majority of Muslims, then these Islamic courts, okay, are legitimate courts and their decisions are binding on Muslims. Although, okay, they were initially appointed by the non-Muslim ruler. Okay, I think that you made it very clear. Then we're going to take a short break then return to Sheikh speaking about the issue of the implementation uh, of these personal laws. Uh, we're going to go for a short break. Please stay with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Back to the Prophet. Join Sheikh Amar in the program Back to the Prophet wherein he teaches us practical lessons from the Prophet's life and how this can help us to overcome our challenges in the present. We talk about the life example of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, seeking guidance for ourselves. In the early days after the revelation of the Holy Quran, the Muslims were greatly persecuted, so much so that quite a few Muslims had to leave Arabia and migrate to Africa to live among Ahl Kitab, Christian people who followed the Gospel of Christ. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Living in the West. Sheikh Haytham, just before the break, we were discussing okay, the legality or the important way of establishing okay, Muslim personal law by using the government to help us establish his wali al-amr. Okay? 
uh, could explain and expand upon this because this concept may seem very alien to many Muslims. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. First of all, we have to be careful. Mm -hmm. We haven't said that the non-Muslim, okay, Wali al-Amr, or the non-Muslim ruler is becoming the Wali al-Amr of Muslimin. So he's not going to be ruling on the Muslims, basically. Yes, we haven't said that, mm. not at all. And we haven't also, uh, we have opposed clearly some fatwas given by some councils where they say that the divorce issued by the non-Muslim judge is binding and is a valid divorce. Of course, here they meant by the divorce marriage dissolution. Mm -hmm. Okay? No, we disagree with this because a qadi, a non-Muslim qadi cannot, uh, cannot decide on Muslims. And this is a matter that has been accepted by all the scholars. And Allah Jalla wa'ala says, وَلَنْ يَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ سَبِيلًا Allah Jalla wa'ala does not give authority for the kafirin, okay, mm -hmm. over the uh, Muslims. And this is uh, clear. Now, but what we are saying is that from an administrative point of view, again, limited, the administrative. Yes, mm -hmm. administrative point of view, the person in charge, whether he is Muslim or he is not Muslims, mm -hmm. he might have some elements of this wilayat al-amr upon the people living under him. If you are working in a company and the head of the company is not Muslim, mm -hmm. by the contract between you and him, you are going to abide by mm -hmm. his uh, way of running the company. Mm -hmm. Don't say that this is a man-made law and I should go against it. No, this is just an administrative mm -hmm. laws to organize how the company okay, uh, will operate. be operate. Mm -hmm operating so this is similar to it that the government okay might have that position from administrative point of view now we see situations where muslims themselves having disputes and they are going to the court mm -hmm. to the civil court to solve their disputes sometimes we say that is fine that is okay and sometimes we say no it is not allowed for you to do so Okay, that's per case. Per it, case. it depends on the um, area of discussion. Okay, now in terms of the Muslim personal law, this is what we are appealing to the governments, and that is, uh, to be honest with you, this is our failure as the Muslim community, with the Muslim community in Britain or in France or uh, in America, that we have not formulated. We have and been able to formulate a memorandum okay, mm -hmm. about what we want in terms of the official recognition. Mm -hmm. We did not have any proposal uh, that covers the shari aspects as well as the legal aspects about this issue. How can we achieve it? In Canada, for example, mm -hmm. you might have heard that this uh, tribunals, family tribunals. There was a row about this family tribunals and the uh, arbitration law uh, five years ago or four years ago. What has happened? The Muslims in Canada uh, proposed that under the arbitration law, they will refer to Sharia. The media took this and they said, now Canada is going to implement Sharia. Mm -hmm. Of course, the anti-Sharia, from non-Muslims and, uh, and Muslims, from Muslims as well, mm. okay? They were marching against this and they could achieve uh, to stop, okay? They could stop this law from being passed. Although the vice chancellor, she said uh, that Muslims should have that right because other faiths, have that right as well and there is nothing wrong with it and it goes under the arbitration law hmm. now this issue of arbitration is a very interesting issue um, maybe it is a legal issue but it's good to touch a little bit uh, about it okay because the arbitration law is 
a very strong avenue for Muslims to use in order to achieve a level of official recognition for the Muslim personal law. How does it work? How does this arbitration law work? Uh, arbitration in Canada is mm. binding, in, uh, in America is binding, in Britain and many European countries is not binding, but the judge and the courts will consider it. What does the arbitration mean? Arbitration means me and you, both of us, agree that if we have disputes about this uh, company that we have established, we will go to X, Y, Z, and we will uh, be judged according to this law. Mm. Now, the, in, in, in financial disputes, this arbitration is binding in the UK, for mm. example, and many European countries. But the uh, marriage contract is not a financial contract, is what is a civil mm -hmm. contract. That's why it, uh, it is not included fully under the Arbitration Act. Mm -hmm. And hence, there are problems okay, in this issue. And from a judicial point of view, the, the problem of the Muslim nikah, okay, the Islamic marriage, mm -hmm. is the fact that it has an, a financial element, which is the dowry. But on the other side, it is a marriage. So it is under the civil law. So can they include it, it under the Arbitration Act or not? Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, this uh, issue of prenuptial agreement, the prenuptial agreement that both couples before marrying Okay, before marriage, mm -hmm. they agree to refer their matters to a certain body. Is it binding or it's not binding? It can be used. Mm -hmm. And the Jewish community in the UK, as well as other countries, are using it, the prenuptial agreement under the arbitration law or and the arbitration law. Now, from uh, an Islamic perspective, from an Islamic perspective, this kind of law will be very, very helpful. Now, in Canada, what happened? This arbitration law is binding and many other faiths okay, are using it. But when Muslims try to use it, then the, uh, they were not allowed to use it. Now, what we are saying, and then the government in Canada uh, used another thing. The government appointed certain imams mm -hmm. as sort of judges in these matters. But they don't call them judges, but they call them official recognized imams. And their decisions are binding. So the imam, for example, if he decides that this marriage has to come to an end and it should be dissolved, his decision on this marriage is binding. One thing. What does binding mean? Mm -hmm. Binding means it is binding on the husband. That's why we need the official recognition. You remember we said that if the imam decides something on the husband and the husband mm -hmm. disputed that. And goes to another imam and gets uh, another verdict. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or he said, no, I disagree. This is still my wife. Then who is going to force him to accept that decision? That's why we said that <laughs> we need an official recognition or we need an external authority uh, or an external body to give us this authority. In Canada, their experience is that the government <coughs> appointed these imams and the decision of those imams are binding on individuals. Binding means that if a husband, uh, the marriage has been dissolved, the husband cannot dispute that. This is one thing. The husband, the second thing, the husband cannot go to another imam and have a different verdict because the the other imam cannot rule against the previous imam. This is one way of solving it, mm -hmm. which is appointing certain imams or appointing certain bodies. The other thing is to have the, the Islamic or those elements from the Muslim personal law incorporated within the judicial system, means officially recognized. And... The last thing about the importance of official recognition is the fact that when uh, a body decides against the husband and 
that the marriage is going to be dissolved and the husband has to pay certain amount of dowry mm -hmm. or certain amount of compensation <laughs> to the wife. If the husband disputed that and the decision is not binding on him, he's not going yeah, I mean, to... This is uh, this issue you're speaking about, Sheikh. I think this is maybe one of the positive benefits is that, and I think from all the, the notes I'm taking here, is it's implementation, really. I mean, like you're saying, if the person has to pay this, who's going to chase him up? Exactly. Who can who's this going woman to go to? Him yeah, who's this woman going to go to? Who's going to help her? That's why. Mm -hmm. That's why we say to those people who are marching against Sharia, and they say Sharia is against women's rights. We are telling them because I am a member of the Islamic Sharia Council, and unfortunately, the, Kingdom, the Islamic is. Sharia Council in mm -hmm. the UK. Um, maybe it is a unique example in <coughs> Europe, and we are marching. We are hoping that other bodies are established in the European countries. Mm. We are telling them, come to the Islamic Sharia Council offices and you will see that 95% of our clients are women. They are the main beneficiaries. So don't say that Sharia is, uh, is a burden on women. Sharia is a solution for women as it is a solution for everyone. Okay, Sheikh Haytham al Haddad, Jazakallah Khair, very poignant and uh, very interesting. I hope you're taking notes like I am. Very interesting topic and a very important topic. Until the next time in Living in the West, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh.